Chapter 5, Section 3, Endosymbiosis and the Origins of Eukaryotes. And this subject happens to be one of my favorite subjects in all of biology, and I'll explain why. First of all, that word endosymbiosis, what does that mean and what is a eukaryote? Well, first of all, let's take the word and break it down. Endo means within, and symbiosis means living together. So endosymbiosis means something is living together, but something's inside of something else. And that will make sense soon enough. Now, first of all, there are two main cell types. One of them you're already familiar with. These are the prokaryotic cells. They are smaller and structurally simple. There are two domains of the prokaryotes. And the first one are the bacteria. And as we know, bacteria are everywhere, including the Staphylococcus bacteria. The other domain are the Archaeans. And Archaeans are known for living in extreme environments, although not always. This is an example of a halobacterium. The second type of cell are eukaryotes. These are much larger, and they have membrane-bound organelles and mitochondria within them. And you can see some of the organelles here. So where did eukaryotes come from? They're special, that's for certain. You see, eukaryotic cells, they're the only type of cell to have ever evolved into multicellular organisms. There are no multicellular prokaryotes, but eukaryotes evolved into things like animals, like this western screech owl, or plants, like these spider lilies, or fungus. So, plants, animals, and fungus are all examples of multicellular organisms made up of eukaryotic cells. So where exactly did the larger and more complex eukaryotes come from? How did they evolve? The origins of eukaryotes has its roots actually in photosynthesis. Now photosynthesis was evolved by small cyanobacteria a long time ago. Now it was a long time after the evolution of photosynthesis occurred that we got eukaryotic cells. And here's why. The prokaryotes were the first organisms on the planet. They were smaller and more structurally simple. And eventually, these prokaryotes evolved into cyanobacteria that released oxygen into the atmosphere. Now, that was a big deal. If I took you back 4 billion years ago to the dawn of life and put you on the Earth, you wouldn't be very happy with me. And the reason why is you would die within a few minutes because there was no oxygen in the atmosphere, like 0.01%. So the very first cells that evolved sometime around 3.8 billion years ago evolved in an atmosphere with little to no free oxygen in it. And then, by 3.5 billion years ago, we get what's called oxygenic photosynthesis. And these are the cyanobacteria that we see today that are green that release oxygen to the atmosphere. And over time, they kept releasing more and more oxygen to the atmosphere, and oxygen levels rose. Eventually, we got something called aerobic respiration. We're going to talk more about aerobic respiration in another lecture. But basically, this is the ability to use oxygen to extract a lot of energy from organic molecules. Once aerobic respiration evolved, then we got the origins of eukaryotic cells. And then eventually, about 600 million years ago, if you notice, there was a lot more oxygen in the atmosphere, we began to get the first animals. Prokaryotes evolved aerobic respiration. Not plants, not animals, and not fungus. Now, aerobic respiration is basically I'm going to take some sugar, like glucose, and I'm going to react it with oxygen in the atmosphere. And in the process, it's going to make carbon dioxide and water. But this process of aerobic respiration releases a lot of energy. But importantly, the process of aerobic respiration evolved by these early bacteria is incredibly efficient at making ATP. Now remember, ATP is our energy currency of the cell. The more ATP you have, the more you can do. This diagram here kind of explains the origins of eukaryotes. You see, it was bacteria that evolved aerobic respiration. It was bacteria that evolved photosynthesis that led to aerobic respiration because of all the oxygen in the atmosphere. However, the origin of eukaryotes began when a bacteria, specifically a proteobacteria capable of aerobic respiration, began living inside of another prokaryote. And we're pretty sure that that um, other prokaryote was an archaeobacteria. So what that means is the 
evolution of eukaryotes began when one cell began to live inside of another cell. Let me explain it further. On the top, we've got our archaean, and on the bottom, we have our aerobically respiring bacteria. And these are two different types of prokaryotes. And they merged together for whatever reason, probably because the aerobically respiring bacteria may have been another parasite. But over time, the nature of their relationship changed. That change almost became more of a mutualistic relationship. Instead of one being a parasite drawing resources from somebody else, the relationship became mutual, mutually beneficial. The larger cell provided nutrients to the smaller cell. The smaller cell, capable of aerobic respiration, provided copious amounts of energy to both of them. Because the arrangement was beneficial, well, you now have extra energy, and the cells began to get larger and more complex as it evolved internal structures. And what those internal structures did was compartmentalize the functionings of the cell. And one of the first internal structures outside of the mitochondria to have evolved was probably the cell nucleus. And we can see the beginnings of the endomembrane system. These are the organelles that are starting to compartmentalize the functionings of the cell. And then eventually we got a modern eukaryotic cell, complete with all types of organelles. Those organelles include the mitochondria for energy production, the Golgi apparatus, which is part of the endomembrane system, same with the endoplasmic reticulum, and the cell nucleus. And these organelles compartmentalize the functionings of the cell. Another important evolutionary feature of eukaryotic cells is the cytoskeleton, which can help give it shape, help it move around, and engulf other large bacteria. Perhaps one of the biggest questions regarding endosymbiosis is, well, how did the two prokaryotes merge together? I provided one hypothesis, that the aerobically respiring bacteria was some type of parasite and bored its way into the archaean. Wherever I look on the web, though, to researching endosymbiosis, I almost always see some larger cell engulfing a smaller cell, and then somehow that smaller cell didn't get digested and remained inside that larger cell and then they both became happy. However, that's probably fairly unlikely. And there's two reasons why that was unlikely. One is to do phagocytosis, which is one cell eating another cell, requires two things, lots of energy and a complex cytoskeleton. And bacteria lack both. They have enough energy for what they need to do, but to engulf another cell and to have, they don't have that kind of energy, they don't have enough ATP production, and they lack a well-developed cytoskeleton. One other interesting thing about endosymbiosis, it almost certainly occurred just one time, and that explains the similarity amongst all eukaryotes. In other classes, you probably have had to learn the difference between plant and animal cells, but in reality, at the cellular level, plants and animals are pretty similar. And when we look around the world, we see two types of cells, prokaryotes, eukaryotes. We don't see the intermediates in nature. We see intermediates in the fossil record with plants and animals. And in fact, some animals today, like horseshoe crabs, have remained unchanged for hundreds of millions of years. And in some ways, we call those a living fossils. But not so with prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Whenever we think about the defining characteristics of eukaryotic cells, the cell nucleus almost always comes to mind, as well it should. And in fact, eukaryote means new kernel, and they were named after the presence of the cell nucleus. However, from an evolutionary point of view, we could also think of the mitochondria as a defining character of eukaryotes. Now, I know not all eukaryotes have mitochondria. The ones that don't lost them because they're intracellular parasites or parasites in general. But from an evolutionary point of view, it was eukaryotes were made possible by the presence of mitochondria. And the reason why is because they were able to use oxygen to make a lot more ATP. Interestingly, one group of eukaryotes went through a second round of endosymbiosis, and that led to the origin of plants. You see, plants did not evolve photosynthesis. They acquired it from cyanobacteria. This is an image of 
Elodia canadensis. This is an aquatic plant. You can see there's very large plant cells. Those green balls moving around are chloroplasts, and that's where photosynthesis actually takes place. And chloroplasts were once free-living cyanobacteria acquired through a second round of endosymbiosis. Now what that means is that plants also have mitochondria and they also do aerobic respiration. So all eukaryotes have basically one energy converting organelle, the mitochondria. That's a site of aerobic respiration. But plants have two energy converting organelles. They have mitochondria and chloroplast. Both of these are the result of endosymbiosis.